world news tonight. Tornado emergency. A massive twister leaves a trail of destruction as Ida makes her way through. Economic crisis. Departure of foreign troops marks a new era of Taliban rule but faces another crisis. Suspected cases. Moderna faces backlash from Japan for contamination of vaccines. And a splish splash. Hong Kong opens doors for everyone to explore the water world. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. Tonight we start off today's coverage with the dangerous storm in the move on the United States. A remnant of Hurricane Ida unleashes tornadoes and flooding in Maryland as the storm hammers the East Coast. New York City Mayor declared a state of emergency due to what he called a historic weather event. Touching down in and around Annapolis, Maryland this afternoon, tornadoes on the ground for many miles after spinning off from Hurricane Ida that slammed Louisiana. Please make sure you're inside. Please make sure you, you, you're in your uh, lowest level of your house. In downtown Annapolis, power lines and signs ripped down in front of businesses. In nearby neighborhoods, roofs torn off and trees uprooted. Meanwhile, in Frederick, Maryland, flash flooding caught a bus driver off guard. 11 school kids rescued as the bus was submerged. Throughout the day, Ida unleashing blinding lightning and torrential rain on the nation's capital. The D.C. metro area under flood warnings and a tornado watch well into the evening. Overnight, three inches of flash rain swamped the region, tearing down trees, flooding intersections, and trapping drivers in their cars. In Rockville, Maryland, hundreds were forced to flee their apartments at 4 a.m. when a swollen river sent a wall of water surging into garden-level apartments as people slept. Police say a 19-year-old man drowned in his apartment, unable to get out. They are now advising that there may possibly be two more adults, and she believes they are underwater. Firefighters used boats to pull people to safety, and all 150 people displaced. One resident still missing. Tonight, Ida continues to unleash tornadoes, dumping record amounts of rain as it marches up the eastern seaboard. President Joe Biden assured Ukraine's leader Vladimir Zelensky that the United States opposes Russian aggression, but he showed no sign of moving on requests to open NATO to the eastern European country. Ukraine President Zelensky making big requests as he meets his American counterpart Joe Biden in the Oval Office. In response, Biden promised that he was firmly committed to Ukraine's sovereignty and, as evidence, he put money on the table. We're revitalizing the Strategic Partnership Commission between our nations. And we're also creating a new strategic defense framework and a new $60 million security assistance package. The military aid will be used to fight Russian-backed separatists in the Donbass region. The war has killed roughly 14,000 people since 2014, when Russia annexed Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula. Another source of security concern for Zelensky, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. The project will transport natural gas directly from Russia to Germany, allowing Russia to bypass Ukraine, depriving it of revenue from transit fees. In July, Biden decided not to apply U.S. sanctions, saying the project had already been nearly finished by the time he got into office and could not be stopped. As Kabul began a new era of Taliban rule, long lines outside banks and soaring prices in the bazaars underline the everyday worries now facing its population after spe a spectacular seizure of the city two weeks ago. The new era of Taliban rule in Afghanistan was marked by the departure of foreign troops, bloody attacks on civilians by Islamic State and now an economic crisis. The country has a sinking currency and rising inflation. More than a third of the population lives on less than $2 a day. Banks, which closed as soon as the Taliban took Kabul, have now been ordered to reopen. 
but that means hours of queuing thanks to strict weekly limits on cash withdrawals. Many offices and shops are still shut and some salaries have been unpaid for weeks, meaning even the relatively well-off are struggling to put food on the table. This market in Kabul has been flooded with people desperate to sell their goods. Remittances from abroad have also been cut off. So many families are trying to sell jewellery or household goods, even if they have to accept a fraction of their value. Prices for vegetables were up to 50% higher, according to vendors, while petrol prices were up by 75%. Taliban officials have said the problems will ease once a new government is in place, but the structural problems run deep. The country has no significant exports to generate revenue, and aid, which accounted for more than 40% of economic output, has abruptly disappeared. With growing uncertainties in Afghanistan after the U.S. military's rapid exit from the country, the Taliban says it will announce uh, tomorrow the formation of a new government. The group will be led by uh, Haibatullah Akunzada and he will head any government council that will be established. Following America's complete withdrawal from Afghanistan, the Taliban said Wednesday that its supreme commander will head any governing council in the country. Saying Haibatullah Abkunzada will be the top leader, the Taliban added there will also be a prime minister post. Abkunzada was appointed to the post in 2016 and since then has had the final word on the group's political, religious and military affairs. The Taliban also stressed the new government will be a model for the Afghan people. Russia's state-run news agency Sputnik reports that the Taliban will announce the formation of a new government on September 3rd. Meanwhile, the Taliban is reportedly in talks with the governments of Qatar and Turkey on ways to manage Kabul airport as it does not have sufficient air traffic control services after the U.S. withdrawal. Technical teams from Qatar are now in Kabul to provide assistance. Wishing to be recognized as a normal state internationally, the Taliban is aiming to quickly resume the airport's operations. This comes as the Taliban is exerting tremendous efforts domestically to fight anti-Taliban forces. The group has sent fighters to the Panjshir Valley stronghold of the National Resistance Front, which includes both anti-Taliban fighters and former Afghan security forces who have vowed to defend the region. The valley, which starts some 80 kilometers north of Kabul, is the main enclave for anti-Taliban forces in Afghanistan. After seen at the wheel of one of his uh, supercars, Thai ultra-royalist Tenet Nat became a well-known face at demonstrations that ushered in Thailand's 2014 coup. 29-year-old Nat has spent his life as a playboy in Thailand. He's the son of a real estate billionaire, typically parading around in supercars. And he has been an ultra-royalist for Thailand's monarchy most of his life. But he's recently had a change of heart. Nat, short for Tanat Thanakit Manoy, was a well-known face at protests that led to Prayut Chan Ocha seizing power in 2014. Now he has flipped to join pro-democracy rallies in Thailand, in part because of outrage over the government's handling of the latest coronavirus outbreak. Nat takes to the stage demanding Prayut to step down and reforms to Thailand's monarchy, all in a fashionable suit. It is clear, brothers and sisters, that the government, military and those in power, as well as the pro-establishments, have been using the Article 112 to suppress those who have opposing views. Article 112 is the Royal Defamation Law. Thailand's economy has taken a hit under the coronavirus and the death toll has reached nearly 12,000. The Deputy Secretary to the Prime Minister has defended the government's handling of the virus that they have taken all necessary measures to contain the spread of infections. That sparked new life into protests against Prayut that began last year. Nat was blinded permanently in his right eye last month after being hit by a tear gas canister at a protest. But he says the injury has only made him stronger. His presence at the protests marks a more diverse group joining the movement, which has largely been led by students. Nat said he has cut himself off from his family, and although some student activists were suspicious of his actions, now they raise the protesters' three-finger salute together. 
the latest on the COVID crisis right after this break. You're watching World News. Welcome back and moving on to the updates on the COVID crisis. India's economy grew by a record 20.1% between April and June compared to the same period last year when the country was experiencing a deep recession. The strong growth comes despite India seeing a surge in COVID-19 cases during that period. Now crossing over to other in a world in special correspondent Gayatri Gunasekar reporting now from Delhi in India for more details. Gayatri. Yes, Shanali, Indian cities have started preparing for a possible third wave of COVID-19 by strengthening the health and medical infrastructure to avoid the horrific scenario that the country witnessed during the first and second wave. India's health infrastructure proved inadequate when COVID-19 cases surged in April and May this year, leading to tens of thousands of deaths as hospitals ran out of oxygen and beds. Infections have started rising again and experts warn another big jump around October, India's peak festival season. Federal and state governments have said they are more prepared this time around. Almost all states are setting up special pediatric wards as experts warn unvaccinated children could be vulnerable to any mutations in the virus. Some states are also stocking up uh, on antiviral drugs. India is also trying to vaccinate a big majority of its 944 million adults with at least one dose before another COVID-19 wave. More than 52% of its adults have been partially vaccinated so far. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than in a world in special correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar reporting from Delhi in India. The World Health Organization has identified another variant that could potentially have immunity to vaccines. For more on, for more on this, let's cross over to other than a world news pressure correspondent. Danushka Marbansa reporting now from Tromsa in Norway. Danushka. Yes, Shanali. The WHO added variant B.1.61 labeled the new variant to the variant of interest list. It said that the new variant has a constellation of mutations that indicate potential properties of immune escape. It's the first variant of interest to be added to the list since June after inclusion of the Lambda variant. This strain was spotted in January in Colombia, and while it makes up less than 0.1% of cases worldwide, it accounts for 34% of all infections in Colombia. While it accounts for only a small percentage of global cases, scientists are studying whether it has properties that would help it get past immune protections built up by vaccinations or past infections. The WHO stressed that more research was needed to understand the mu various effects, but Dr. Griffin said there was no evidence that suggested that it fit the bill as an escape variant. However, data showed mu variants to be more resistant to antibodies. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent Danish Kamar once reporting from Tromsø from Norway. Japan's health ministry said that contaminants found in suspended Moderna COVID-19 vaccines were particles of stainless steel and it did not expect they would pose an additional health risk. Authorities in Japan have reported another suspected case of contamination in Moderna's coronavirus vaccines, the fourth such incident in less than a week. The country suspended the use of over 1.6 million doses of Moderna shots last week, after being notified of contamination in some of the supply. The latest incident comes from Kanagawa Prefecture, where several black particles were found in a vial of vaccine. It added that 3,790 people had already received shots from the same lot, but the rest is put on hold. The Japanese government has said the particles may be pieces of rubber caused from needles that were incorrectly inserted into vials, breaking off bits of the rubber stopper. Moderna and Spanish pharmaceutical company Rovi, which bottles Moderna vaccines, have said the cause could be a manufacturing issue, and European safety regulators have launched an investigation. Moderna says no safety or efficacy issues had been identified from the issue. The vaccine's Japanese domestic distributor, Takeda Pharmaceutical, did not immediately respond to a request for comment on the Kanagawa incident. But the company posted a notice on its website on Wednesday, saying that on rare occasions during manufacturing, rubber stopper material can get mixed into the vaccine solution. 
The contamination incidents come as Japan is battling its worst wave of infections, driven by the Delta variant. About 45 percent of its population has been fully vaccinated, lagging behind several developed countries. An ever-swelling amount of space debris is threatening satellites that hover around Earth, making insurers leery of offering coverage to devices that transmit texts, maps, videos and scientific data. Outer space has a litter problem. Earth orbit is filling up with man-made junk. There are over 8,000 satellites up there, with more than 40% now inactive. Then there are thousands of bits of random debris from old launches. And that raises the risk of collisions, putting the satellite business at risk. Insurers have told that they are increasingly wary of providing cover. One, Assure Space, says it has generally stopped insuring spacecraft in low Earth orbit. The few policies it has provided exclude collision damage. Elon Musk is one to face questions. Good job. His SpaceX rocket company has been busy launching satellites for its space-based broadband service. The firm wouldn't say whether it had insurance. Other major firms, including Google, Amazon and Apple, depend on satellites to move data. Science, telecoms and other sectors would face huge challenges if orbital systems stopped working. Industry experts say only half of all satellite launches are now insured with that proportion expected to fall further. Some fear that space could get so crowded that a cascade of collisions could be set off. For now, at least, that is theoretical. Over the past decade, only 11 spacecraft have been totally or partially destroyed by collisions, according to consultancy CERA data. But the risks are growing, and that makes it ever harder to ignore the underlying problem. Right now, no one is doing anything to tidy up space. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. German Chancellor Angela Merkel opened a new epidemic intelligence hub with WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom. The Chancellor took a blushing approach to high praise heaped on her, thanking him for a heavy medal and saying that there was still much to be done. The Spring Finals was sent a stage at the Paralympics and it ended up a golden night for out of Chinese athletes. 33-year-old Gao Fang won a gold medal, her first Paralympic Games in the women's 100-meter T53. Ontario, Canada's most populous province, said that people would have to show digital proof they had been inoculated against COVID-19 to enter a wide range of establishments, dropping earlier opposition to the idea. The first batch of BioNTech's SE's COVID-19 vaccine arrived in Taiwan today, helped by the involvement of two of the world's most important tech firms after months of heated political and diplomatic wrangling. A Texas ban on all abortions after six weeks of pregnancy took effect after the U.S. Supreme Court failed to act on an emergency request by abortion rights groups to block the law. The remains of 109 Chinese soldiers killed in the 1950 to 1953 Korean War were turned to China today from the Republic of Korea. Escorted by two jet fighters, the plane was given a water salute at the airport. China is to limit under-18s to three hours of a week of online gaming, prompting a furious backlash from dedicated young gamers and a stock price tumble for Crafton and other major players in the market. China may have united teenage gamers and stock market investors. Both have reacted sharply to a move to limit online game time for the under-18s. Beijing announced the move on Monday, saying teens would only be allowed three hours per week. The move is intended to strengthen controls over society, which leaders think has become too free and easy. Young gamers were furious. Some said the move would derail budding eSports careers. One, calling himself Mr. Zhu, said the move would anyway backfire. I don't think the new regulation makes any sense. Although it aims to help teenagers, the less you let them play, the more curious they'll be. Tuesday saw gaming stocks take a hit. 
There were falls for US-listed NetEase, Japan's Nexon and South Korea's Krafton, maker of online hit PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds. Though Chinese giant Tencent ended the day over 3% higher, after analysts noted it had already introduced limits on gaming by miners. Investors say the worry for the industry isn't about an immediate hit to revenues. One told it's more about whether Beijing could stop approving new games, as it did for a while in 2018. Another said the curbs could mean fewer teens get the gaming habit, hitting revenues in the long term. Some Chinese parents might think that would be no bad thing. And finally tonight, Hong Kong's latest water park opened its doors for a demonstration event before the park is slated to open to the public at the end of the month. Waterworld, which is nestled along the island's south coast, covers 16 acres of land, offering visitors a wide range of options to cool down in Hong Kong's subtropical climate. The attraction, which suffered years of delays and was slated to open in 2017, will be nearly twice as big as Hong Kong's previous water park, which closed its doors in 1997. Waterworld is owned by Ocean Park, which is currently experiencing huge losses and has been relying on government funding for the past two years. Doors will open to the public on the 21st of September. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.